Jesus. Don't die. So I think uh, we're going to get started. Um, just want to introduce myself. I'm Barnelli Chaudhary. I'm the director of the Nathanson Center. Uh, we're the ones sort of, I guess, sponsoring this event, but really um, the brainchild is right beside me. But before I introduce him, uh, I just want to do the, start with the land acknowledgement. So York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which the university campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Con Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So thank you again for all for being here. I'm going to introduce you to our organizer for this event, uh, Valeria Dostovna. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Chaduri. Thank you, uh, Bernali. Um, so yes, Dean Adamson uh, Center is the sponsor of this event. And I want to thank the director of the Netanson, the other components, together with me of the executive committee, Professor uh, Palma Pachocco, for supporting this event. And of course, uh, the person without which we couldn't have all this event without our administrative support. Liel Gonzalez, uh, thank you so much, Liel, for everything that you have done to bring uh, us together today. Um, so the idea, the idea behind uh, today's symposium is to bring together um, people that at Osgood constantly do research or teach or think about the interaction of uh, technology and various aspects of the law and how technology impacts on societies and how the law can respond, can offer solutions for those challenges that uh, technologies can pose to, uh, to our societies, in fact. Um, at Osgood, we have a thriving community of people that do research and teach on the intersection of law and technology, and we have uh, some of uh, these uh, brilliant people uh, here today, and then me, uh, but um, the idea was to come together and reflect on the next generation of internet technologies, and actually what we as lawyers have to say about them. Uh, the title of this event is the legal implications of the metaverse, but actually what we're going to address uh, goes beyond that and impacts more or less uh, several aspects of uh, Web uh, 3.0, uh, which is of course a broader but interconnected notion with the metaverse. So Web 3.0 of course is composed by many components, including uh, semantic web, uh, AI-enabled, uh, web, and we have uh, in the last few weeks uh, all heard about the new uh, iterations of this and uh, what ChatGPT uh, has brought to the debate and how that will affect our societies, but also the legal profession and in general the law. And then we, uh, in the Web 3.0, we also have uh, virtual reality, 3D graphics, and special web blockchain and cryptocurrencies and of course enhanced connectivity and all that is a sort of power engine for the metaverse 
which uh, we can describe as a sort of virtual space that puts together or is put together by many, uh, uh, several platforms that use the technologies that I have just mentioned to create a more interactive and immersive internet experience. Now, why do we as lawyers need to be concerned about the, all this? Uh, Web 3.0 is on the brink of happening, and as lawyers, we haven't really mastered Web 2.0. We can say that we are walking into this with legal um, regulation at the very least that was in many cases conceived at the dawn of the internet and has failed to keep pace with the various um, iterations of technologies uh, up to today. Uh, the technology that have composed Web 2.0 um, have sparked a series of challenges and risks and created an accumulation of power and wealth that nobody could imagine when, for instance, social network were introduced. Nobody could imagine that social network could be um, at the center of revolutions around the world, but also at the center of attempts to uh, undermine and uh, append democracies, and also in some cases to foster genocide. Um, we, as lawyers, were prepared for that, and we have signaled the risks of these many interactions, but the regulation was very slow to react, precisely because of the amount of wealth and power that people have accumulated thanks to these uh, technologies that get, got in the way of properly regulating uh, the technologies themselves. Uh, as lawyers, we have a duty to be prepared to what comes next, and this is why we are uh, holding this uh, symposium uh, today. So thank you very much for being with us today. I want to thank you um, to thank also the people that are uh, connected online. And without further ado, I will uh, now give the floor to the first of our speakers of today, Professor Caris Craig. Professor Craig is the academic director of the uh, Osgood Professional Development LLM program in uh, intellectual property law. Uh, she teaches and researches in the areas uh, of intellectual property, copyright, trademark law, and legal theory. Professor Craig, thank you so much. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I just want to check that the mic is working and the slides are up. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, well, thank you everyone for being here, first and foremost, and thanks to Valerio and Bernali and the Nathanson Centre for bringing us together to talk about the subject of law and the metaverse. I'm uh, not quite ready to say the important subject of law in the metaverse because I think in part that's what we're here today to consider, right? How salient, how substantive really are the new challenges, if any new challenges, that the metaverse presents for law? But before I get ahead of myself, I want to give you a sense of the kinds of issues, whether they're new or not so new, maybe that the metaverse is presenting for the law of intellectual property specifically. So, fingers crossed, yes? Hello. Okay, so um, whatever the metaverse is, um, or may be or become, we know that it is conceptualized as being a virtual world in which we, that is people come avatars, engage in economic, social, and cultural activities. And this, where the economic and social and cultural meet, that's the domain of intellectual property law. So in the digital environment, we can go even further and say that everything implicates intellectual property. Right? Every algorithm, uh, every software code that creates the digital universe, its, its appearances, its affordances, is itself a literary work that copyright protects. And then every aspect of the user interface, every image or visual element that we encounter on the screen or on our headsets, that can be a separate artistic copyright work akin to a picture or a movie or a video game. The avatars and the virtual world that they inhabit are all, in other words, copyright works brought into being by other underlying copyright works. And that's just the start, right? Because at that point, uh, the avatars and the virtual world that they inhabit can begin buying branded clothing, they can create art and buy art, they can set up stores and art galleries, they can build buildings, they can perform dance routines, and so on. Right? So once businesses start creating and selling their products, 
and creators start showcasing their creations and performers start putting on shows and celebrities start making celebrity appearances. Then consumers start consuming, users start using, and we have layers upon layers of intellectual property ownership and exclusive rights and assignments and licenses in terms of service and fair uses and user-generated content and inevitably infringing activities. Right, all of which are subject to this tangle of complex national jurisdiction specific laws whose application in the metaverse is going to be anything but clear. So let's start with a couple of um, high profile web 3.0 examples just to illustrate. Both of these concern NFTs and of course the relationship between NFTs and the metaverse remains a little bit hazy, but we can say that NFTs have become an important object of ownership in virtual markets in the metaverse. Anyway, one of the fun facts about NFT ownership is that it currently is not integrated in any systematic way at all with any existing intellectual property systems. So what happens when the digital file represented by the NFT contains a copyright work or a trademark product? And how does the transfer or the sale of the token implicate the rights of the IP owner in the underlying work or subject matter? On the one hand, you might say an NFT is really just a web link. On the other, its value is in the subject or the asset to which the link points. And that underlying asset and its commercial value um, often resides in intellectual property. So one example uh, which our student Andrew Mass and I see over there is blogging about for the epilogue is the famous Bored Apes uh, collection released as NFTs by Yuga Labs. And this was, these were bought for thousands of dollars by the likes of Tom Brady and Jimmy Fallon. Purchasers of these NFTs were told that they acquired something absolutely unique, right? as well as the commercial use rights to make any spin-offs of their particular ape. But it's only the token that's unique. The artwork itself can be reproduced by anyone who sees it, anyone who takes a screenshot, knows how to right-click, or as one uh, engineer did, uh, use them to train AI that can actually generate an infinite number of bored apes. Uh, not least because there's probably no copyright in the underlying machine-generated gener images that people think they're buying. That's a whole different paper, but uh, just trust me on that one for now. <laughs> so, um, when a conceptual artist, Ryan uh, Ryder Rips, created copycat NFTs, Yuga Labs actually opted not to sue for copyright infringement, probably because they didn't have copyright, and instead they ended up suing for a uh, trademark infringement for a use of the Basie logo. Another example at the intersection of art and copyright and trademarks was this controversial Meta Birkin court ruling in the US a couple of weeks back. So here, Mason Rothschild had created digital images of faux fur covered Hermes Birkin bags and sold these digital images, the Meta Birkins, using NFTs for prices compatible to real handbags. Um, Hermes has, of course, trademark rights in the Birkin name, and it has a distinctive appearance, trade dress uh, rights in the Birkin bag design. Um, so they sued Rothschild for trademark infringement and unfair competition. And the question was, you know, were the Birkin, uh, the meta Birkin images, a counterfeit? A counterfeit what? Like a counterfeit handbag? So does Hermes have trademark rights that extend to a digital handbag image in the metaverse? So in the US, under something called the Rogers test, the, the use of a trademark in an artistic work is actionable only if the use has no artistic relevance to the underlying work or explicitly misleads us to its source. So the question became, was the meta Birkin NFT artistic expression under the Rogers test in the First Amendment, or was it non-artistic trademark use that was likely to cause consumer confusion as to source? And a nine-person jury uh, last month decided wrongly, to my mind, that it was the latter, that it was a violation of the Birkin mark. Um, and if this stands, we might then ask ourselves, like, what does or does the same hold for every appearance of a branded product in the metaverse and for every NFT that someone might drop that contains a real world product with a logo or a recognizable design? Is that going to be enforceable? Is it going to be sustainable? Is that what we want? Right? I've already tried to capture the sheer 
ubiquity of IP in the metaverse environment. So imagine now the kind of immersive virtual reality experience to which metaverse proponents aspire, in which our reality is simulated, our world is effectively recreated in a digital universe. Are people wearing the clothes that we see them wear in, in the real world? Are they walking past the same recognizable buildings and storefronts? Are they listening to the same music? Are they driving the same cars? And if so, do all of those appearances and uses and reproductions, are they all controlled by the same IP owners, subject to their permissions and their payments and their terms? And if so, really what's so meta about that? Right? We've already encountered all of these issues in the context of video games. So Lindsay Lohan famously, in the end, unsuccessfully sued the makers of Grand Theft Auto, claiming that they misappropriated her likeness and persona. She was flattering herself. Um, Prince, uh, Fresh Prince star uh, Ribeiros brought suits against Epic Games and Take Two for using his famous Carlton dance as an emote in Fortnite. They also fended off a lawsuit by a tattoo artist who claimed that the reproduction and sale of her of her tattoo on um, LeBron James, or at least on his avatar in the NBA game, was an infringing reproduction of her artistic work. And Activision prevailed uh, in a lawsuit brought by the makers of uh, Humvees for their unlicensed inclusion in the Call of Duty game. Here, actually, the Rogers test was found to apply, right? So the digital Humvees were found to be artistic expression that was used to achieve realism in the game and therefore permitted without a license. So in Canada, if that's where indeed we are in the metaverse, um, if we want a realistic immersive experience, like you see here on the left in Call of Duty in Amsterdam, one that doesn't depend upon permissions and payments and exclusions at every single turn, we're going to need to rely on a strong set of user rights and clear limits and exceptions to IP protections. Unfortunately, we don't really have those in the real world of IP. Right? There is a limited uh, exception in Canada that allows for the reproduction of a public building or sculpture in a public place, but it's going to apply only if the metaverse environment counts as a cinematographic work. There are many countries that don't even have that freedom, the freedom of panorama. So in France, for example, lucky for Mark Zuckerberg with his incredibly realistic um, <laughs> rendering of the Eiffel Tower, um, that is actually in the public domain, but not if you want to show it at night with the light show. We allow in Canada incidental inclusion of one, work, one copyright work in another, but only if that's not deliberate, which can hardly be said if it's carefully coded into the metaverse environment. And in Canada, there is no broad transformative fair use exception for repurposing copyright works. There is no Rogers test in trademark law. Any use that's likely to confuse or depreciate a mark can be enjoined without any available defense or seemingly any regard for freedom of expression. So in Canada, then, how should we understand the rights of real life trademark owners as they migrate into the metaverse? It seems like... Um, it seems likely, sorry, that famous brands are going to be able to prevail in infringement claims against those people who reproduce their branded products or services in the metaverse. One of the funny things about trademark law is its compounding nature. The stronger the protections um, are assumed to be, the stronger they become. So if consumers think that the use of a trademark in the metaverse must be licensed, then licensed it must be, right? The mistaken inference of authorization or license can amount to confusion and so to trademark infringement. And we've allowed the expansion of trademark rights in this way through licensing, through merchandising mechanisms in the real world and our branded culture, and now we're gonna see its implications in the metaverse, which is just gonna become like the metaverse or the meta mall where we encounter all of these trademark products once again. So, that, however, is a sort of defensive strategy that trademark owners are unlikely to rely upon. There's a whole new universe here of commercial opportunity, or so we're told. And so inevitably then it's time for the gold rush, right? The gold rush to the register in IP terms. Um, so until recently, to register a trademark in Canada, you had to use it in Canada. That meant there had to be some sale of goods in Canada, some performance of service, some benefits experienced by Canadians in Canada. This is no longer the case. Uh, we've changed the law, and now basically all you have to do to get a registered trademark is apply for a registered trademark. 
At some point down the road, you do have to use it. And so we are going to have to ask, what does it mean to use a trademark in the metaverse? Um, and is the metaverse in Canada and when? Um, for now, though, the important thing, according to the trademark lawyers, is just to apply for metaverse marks right before anybody else does. So we have another Osgood student, Andrew Stavros, who's doing some research um, on this question. He found 160 trademark applications pending that included the term metaverse in the trademarks database. About one third of those claimed for digital goods. And those present some interesting questions. So consider, for example, this one, the application by Kraft Foods for Velveeta cheese in virtual restaurants. I don't know about you, but I like my cheese real. <laughs> um, on the other hand, it's a pretty good strategy or a pretty good diet plan. If you're going to dine in a Wendy's, better that it's a virtual Wendy's. Um, we also have Nike has an application for the sale of virtual shoes. Um, so you can actually already buy Nikes for your avatar in the NBA video game. A pair of Nike Crypto Kicks already sold as NFTs for almost 200,000 US dollars. Um, and okay, but what happens if your avatar falls and scrapes its virtual knee? Right? Well, don't worry, because you can get a virtual band-aid for that. Okay. So, <laughs> in trademark law, we have something called the first sale doctrine, which means that once you buy a pair of Nike shoes, for example, you can resell them. You can sell them to a friend or sell them on eBay. But according to Nike, that doesn't mean that you can mint an NFT of the shoes and sell the token for future exchange with the actual physical shoes. So Nike's actually in a legal battle with StockX for doing just that. We might ask, is that any different than using a thumbnail photo of the shoes that you own on eBay? The future then of this first sale doctrine is really uncertain in the metaverse, okay? Because every sale really requires the reproduction of digital files and so implicates copyright, if not trademark. Anyway, the assumption we're see we seem to be making here is that virtual products are simply digital analogs for their real world equivalents, right? That goodwill acquired in the real world will naturally flow to the virtual realm, that trademark owners are entitled to claim in the metaverse what's already theirs by right. Um, and there are a few problems with this. Just practically speaking, um, for one thing, uh, the same trademark might have different owners in different jurisdictions. So which one is entitled to it in the metaverse? But also the trademark owner's rights over the mark only exist in connection with specific wares and services, and only if the mark is distinctive of the owner as source. Trademarks are not owned absolutely. We protect goodwill in a mark because it communicates to consumers a certain consistency of quality and a common trade source. But does it here? Right? If we like Nike shoes because we know they're, they're consistently comfortable or they're a good fit for our feet, is the same true? for the digital shoes that we buy, and does our avatar care? So I think here what's happening is um, that we're protecting or thinking about the trademark increasingly as though it's a piece of property in itself, as though it's something valuable in its own right, not for what it communicates to consumers about the product or services, their source or quality, but as a valuable signifier now without any real referent. Right? It is, I think, the final brick in the wall of what Naomi Klein called out in her book, No Logo. This is the idea of, sort of brand propertization. She complained that the metaphorical, metaphorical alligator of Lacoste had essentially risen up and swallowed the literal shirt in our branding culture. Now in the metaverse, the shirt isn't even real. Right? There is only the mark. So I'm just going to finish up. I've got my eye on the time, and I want to wrap up with a couple of thoughts by way of conclusion. First, in thinking about this topic, I was reminded by Dan Burke of the article by Frank Easterbrook, The Law of the Horse. Having been asked to write in the 1990s about law and cyberspace, he was arguing we ought not to do that, right? To struggle to match an imperfect legal system to an evolving world that we understand poorly. Instead, we should be continuing to learn and apply the general rules of law. This caution seems apt here too, right? IP law in the metaverse is really just IP law. It can just keep working as it does. If, I would add, we want to replicate what we already have in the real world and online. But do we? So this is the final point that I'll leave you with. In his uh, 2003 piece, The Second Enclosure Movement, James Boyle described the first enclosure movement where the commons was taken from the people and turned into private property of the wealthy. 
And he explained that in the early days of the 21st century, we were in the middle of a second enclosure movement, the enclosure of the intangible commons of the mind. Once again, he said, things that we formerly thought of as uncommodifiable are being covered with new or newly extended property rights. While many proponents of the metaverse wax philosophical about the digital emancipation that the metaverse will bring, right? Freed from the trials of embodied existence and the tethers of physical space, we can enjoy the bounty of a world whose boundaries are drawn only by the limits of our imagination. And yet, right, here we are again in this borderless world drawing boundaries with law to mark off our private domain with intellectual property. Somehow we can't even imagine an entirely metaphysical, metaphorical place without setting about our task of private appropriation. Dan Hunter explained in 2002 the risks of thinking about cyberspace as place. This metaphorical conception of place, he warned, would lead us to the implication that there is property online and that this property should be privately owned and parceled out and exploited. And so it was. Well, now there's not just a cyberspace to be conquered and claimed, but a whole metaverse, right? And I think if IP is the means by which we divide it up and meet it out, I think that utopian revolutionary promise of the metaverse is actually no more real than the Nike shoes on your avatar's feet. Thank you, I'll end there. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Professor Barnali Chudori. Uh, she's the director of the Nathanson Center and a, a professor of law. She teaches and researches on business and international economic issues, especially as they intersect with uh, human rights issues. Uh, professor Chudori, you have the floor. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, and thank you for all for coming to this. It's such a great to have a. It's so great to have this amazing turnout, so uh, we're really delighted with that as well. I also want to give special thanks to Valerio for putting together this uh, conference, which I think uh, we wouldn't have come up with without his uh, expertise, so thank you so much, Valerio. Now, I'm going to be talking about uh, the issues relating to business and human rights, um, from, sorry, related to the metaverse from the perspective of uh, business and human rights. And my specific interest is really whether, the, whether business has different responsibilities for human rights protection in the metaverse than they would have in the non-digital world. But before we get going, I thought maybe we should look at some of the benefits that the metaverse can offer to human rights. So some of the things that the metaverse can offer is that it can help with the right to health. So examples include the use of metaverse-related technology to treat lazy eye disorder in children or to act as an aid in finding tumors in diagnostic imaging scans. The metaverse is also being used to help with the right to education. So education in the metaverse can bring together students from different locations, which increases the reach of a particular education institution, as well as provides greater access to education for students. It can also enable students to be able to understand and manipulate data in 3D. And this gives them the opportunity to learn from simulations and to practice procedures without any risk. And finally, the metaverse is enabling different forms of protest and freedom of expression, particularly in areas where it might be physically impossible or dangerous to protest. However, beyond these human rights benefits, the metaverse also raises risks to human rights. So for one, it continues down the path that other technological advances have already made in creating threats to privacy. So most of us are already aware of the threats to our data privacy that the internet poses through its things like its data collection and data sharing functions. And for the most part, the privacy concerns center around information data. So information like our names, our address, or our credit card information. And the metaverse is going to continue these human rights risks, although as some commentators have already noted, the metaverse is going to involve data collection on steroids. And that's because the technology involved in the metaverse is going to enable the capture of much more specific information about us. So information like our eye movement, our body poses, our voice, and even the way we scrunch our noses. All of this information is going to be tracked. And this biometric data information will then be used to make inferences about us. 
So for instance, if we look at tracking data about eye movement, we can see that it reveals a host of information about a person. So it includes information like their gender, their age, their ethnicity, their body weight, their personality traits, their drug consumption habits, their emotional state, their skills and abilities, their fears, their interests, even their sexual preferences and their physical and mental and health conditions. And if we look at things like voice and speech analysis, that's going to look at the way that we speak and whether that's going to be able to help us decipher information about things like our physical traits, our geographical origin, our emotions, our level of intoxication and sleepiness, our age, our gender, our health conditions, and even our socioeconomic status. So in other words, we may enter the metaverse simply to enjoy a game or some other type of leisure activity, and we actually end up revealing intimate portraits about our lives without even knowing about it. Now, the metaverse also raises concerns about autonomy. So human rights are protections of our normative agency, and as a result, limitations on our autonomy can have an impact on the agency that underpins our human rights. Now, the metaverse creates a situation that has been described as patiency, as in the status of a patient, or the opposite of agency. So in the metaverse, things are done to you, and you often can't do much in return. The metaverse also raises issues about usability or accessibility. So concerns have been raised that the metaverse does not enable people with different disabilities to use it, or there are also issues about whether it's usable for the elderly or children. There's also concern whether the metaverse will be fully accessible to those that are in the global south, given that individuals there might not be able to afford the technological requirements that the metaverse will require. And another human rights risk from the metaverse may result from virtual harassment. So one of the key features of the metaverse is the feeling that users have of being immersed in an environment. So being in an immersed environment makes things feel as real or even more real than if the person was really experiencing it. So when a person is harassed in the metaverse, although the harassment is virtual, not only does the harassment feel real, but the sensations can actually even be heightened. Now, as researchers have reported, people have already been harassed in the metaverse. So in one case, um, an avatar has per pursued another avatar and engaged in virtually sexually inappropriate actions. And even worse, when avatars have been sexually harassed, other avatars have stopped to watch, which exacerbates feelings of isolation in the victim. There have also been multiple reports of cyberbullying in the metaverse, including hate speech, threats of violence, and the sharing of sexually explicit materials with children. Concerns have also been raised that since these events happen in real time, it's difficult to police them. It leaves the abusers with considerable amount of power to inflict human rights violations on others. So one victim reported that when she asked her abuser to stop, he replied, it's the metaverse, I'll do what I want. So all this goes to show that the metaverse does seem to have a bit of a human rights problem, but that raises the question as to whose role it is to regulate the metaverse to stop these human rights violations. Is it the governments? Is it business? Is it the end users? Or is it somebody else entirely? So to answer this question, we need to remember that no matter where one is in the world, whether that be Toronto, Tallinn, or Timbuktu, that we are all entitled to human rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaims that everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms that are set forth in the Declaration. We also know that the obligation to ensure that our human rights are protected is given to the government or the state. And in fact, that the state has three obligations under international law for human rights protection. They have an obligation to protect, respect, and fulfill human rights. So that is, they have an obligation to protect us against human rights abuses. They have an obligation to refrain from interfering with or curtailing our enjoyment of human rights. And they have an obligation to take positive action to facilitate our enjoyment of human rights. So in other words, states have a legal obligation to protect human rights in their territory. We also know that under international law, business has different responsibilities for human rights than states. 
So whereas a state has a legal responsibility to protect, respect, and fulfill human rights, business only has a responsibility, not a legal obligation, to respect human rights. And the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights tell us that that means that a business is obliged to have a responsibility not to harm human rights and to be duly diligent in respecting human rights. So to some extent, we can say that there is some logic behind the lesser responsibility for corporations than states for protecting human rights. Of course, a state has sovereign authority over a territory, so they can make whatever rules that they want to protect human rights. And in the non-digital world, of course, businesses don't have this same power. But in the metaverse, it's unclear who has sovereign authority over the metaverse to enforce human rights protection. One possibility could be that the business uh, in the form of the metaverse platform owner should be the one that's responsible. So for instance, uh, is it possible that Animoca Brands, which is the corporate owner of Sandbox, one of the most popular metaverse platforms, are they the ones that should have responsibility for human rights? Or should it be China, where Animoco Brands is headquartered? Or should it be the owner of individual lands in the metaverse on which a human rights violation has occurred? So for example, if the human rights violation occurs at a Snoop Dogg concert on Snoop Dogg's land in the metaverse, should Snoop Dogg be the one that's held responsible? So while determining who is ultimately responsible for enforcing human rights in the metaverse is still currently unclear, what is clear is that the classic paradigm of states having primary responsibility for the protection of human rights has been upended in the metaverse. So since the metaverse is created by corporations, then it's arguable that corporations actually in the metaverse are the ones with the so-called sovereign authority, just like the state is in the classic paradigm. So in other words, the corporation as the creator of either the metaverse itself or lands within it uh, has taken on the role of the de facto role of sovereign ruler. And just like the state takes on human rights obligations um, as the sovereign ruler, then one could expect businesses to take on similar roles in the metaverse. What is interesting is that if we decide that the corporation should bear the role of the human rights protector in the metaverse, then businesses may have to take on comparable human rights roles to states in the non-digital world. So that would mean that in the metaverse, corporations have the responsibility to protect, respect, and fulfill human rights. This means that they would be required to protest, protect us against human rights abuses, refrain from interfering with or curtailing our enjoyment of human rights, and take positive action to facilitate our enjoyment of human rights. That's a much larger role for corporations vis-a-vis -vis human rights than that has been contemplated by the United Nations Pr Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. The UNGPs would only require businesses not to harm human rights and be duly diligent in respecting human rights if it was applied in the metaverse. Now, one possible way to ensure that corporations would take on their role of protectors of human rights in the metaverse would be to establish a metaverse charter of human rights. So this would lay out the human rights that need to be protected in the digital world and what businesses' legal obligations would be to protect these rights. The metaverse charter would be akin to the UN charter of human rights in the non-digital world and every metaverse platform provider or even every entity establishing a land in the metaverse would be required to adhere to the obligations in the charter. However, we need one additional component which doesn't exist with the UN charter and that's to ensure its enforceability. So this could be done, for example, by making the metaverse charter enforceable in an international court or in arbitration. But even if we were to expand corporate obligations for protecting human rights in the metaverse, it wouldn't mean that governments wouldn't have a role as well. So governments, for example, could be in charge of developing protocols to assure the protection of human rights in the metaverse. They could be required to enact data protection legislation which limits both the collection and use of both information data as well as biometric data. And businesses' failure to adhere to such data protection legislation could also be enforced by independent governmental agencies. 
So in fact, this can actually be one of the key roles for governments in this area, and that is to provide oversight of all the activities that would otherwise be governed by companies in the metaverse. Now, this all just goes to show you that the metaverse offers both risks and opportunities to human rights. But at present, there is no particular body that is responsible for human rights protection, which can result in the risks outweighing the benefits. So unless we want the metaverse to continue to resemble the Wild West, we need both states and corporations to step up and do their part in protecting human rights. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chudori, for uh, this presentation. And um, thank you also for sticking to the time. Um, we are uh, somehow uh, time pressed by another event that uh, will start. Uh, so, um, but uh, um, the next presentation is uh, from uh, is a joint presentation from Professor Jinian Lin and Professor Ivan Ozai. Professor Li uh, was the form, uh, is the former uh, interim dean of Osgood and a global leading expert in the field of taxation law. Uh, professor Ozai uh, researches and is a professor at Osgood, of, uh, of course, and also researches and teaches in national and in international tax law. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Valerio. Uh, Okay, so let's talk about tax. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, uh, the, the idea of this symposium is to talk about opportunities and challenges from the metaverse, so the, the, the upside and the, the downsides of the metaverse. But, but as you know, lawyers are often considered to be pessimistic. And uh, tax lawyers in particular, I think often, not always, but oftentimes are the pessimists in the room. So Professor Jin and Lee and I uh, tend to see more challenges than opportunities arising from uh, the metaverse. So, so that's what we're going to be discussing today. So uh, just a brief outline, we're going to start talking about the ta tax challenges from the metaverse, then some of the tax policy implications from it, and also some of the discussions we're having today at, at the international level about how to uh, make tax systems, uh, to adapt our current tax systems to new technologies, right? So uh, when we talk about new technologies, and metaverse is just one example of this, uh, we tend to say that uh, it's not that new technologies create a new problem that we mostly, in most cases, don't create a new problem that we didn't have before, but usually for tax law, it tends to exacerbate problems that we already had. So from a tax law perspective, when we think about, for example, enacting any, any taxes, uh, we, tend, we need to ask these five questions. We need to know what we want to tax, uh, we need to know when we're going to be taxing that thing we decided to tax, who we're going to tax, and also where we should be taxing that phenomenon. So in other, in other words, what jurisdiction should be entitled to tax that thing, and finally, how much we should tax. And with new technologies, these questions become increasingly difficult to answer. So uh, we don't know exactly, because we don't understand these new technologies that well, we don't understand exactly what we are taxing. Uh, we may not be sure when it's taxing, because our tax systems uh, today, they were designed for a brick and mortar, econ a brick and mortar economy, uh, which means we tend to require physical things, or, if, or, or to tax things that are not maybe physical, but they can be mat materialized in uh, physical things. So when we don't have materialization, it's difficult to determine when things take place. And uh, equally, it's difficult to determine who we're going to tax because uh, uh, with new technologies, it's become more difficult to identify people. And because we are talking about digital things that are happening, it's also difficult to determine where these things are taking place because they are not physically uh, material. Uh, and finally, uh, when we think about uh, these new technologies, crypto assets, the metaverse, they work with a currency that's not fiat money. So it's not national currencies, but instead a currency uh, in their own virtual world. So it's difficult to estimate how much we want to tax to. So uh, 
the, the problem with the metaverse is that uh, we don't have one definition of metaverse. Different people define metaverse differently. They consider dif different features. So we thought that it might be helpful to, to think about tax policy problems to, to consider one example as a case study. So we're gonna discuss this example of Decentraland. And for those who are not that familiar with metaverse, Decentraland is one of the uh, biggest, uh, let's say, metaverses we have today. Uh, and for those who are familiar, you may know that it's not a very, doesn't look to be a very successful one. But the reason why we're choosing uh, Decentraland is because some of the features we have in Decentraland uh, are probably gonna be replicated in uh, metaverses we're gonna be seeing uh, in the future. So basically, we, we don't have one metaverse, right? We can't talk about the metaverse, but we have different metaverses run by different uh, companies. So uh, in this case here for Decentraland, this is a, a virtual world, and it's uh, organized by what we call a decentralized autonomous organization, which means this is not an entity, and from a legal perspective, it is not anything, right? So most uh, jurisdictions today don't really have a legal, uh, uh, they don't have legal implications, they don't consider uh, DAOs to exist. So this is basically a way to organize decision making so, such that instead of having one central uh, body that is controlling and, and making decisions uh, for the business, instead of that we have this decentralized organization where each individual who owns a token uh, in the in the central lands, its users, the central lands users make decisions collectively. So, if you have a token, you are able to vote and participate in the decision making. And uh, the central land is built on the Ethereum blockchain. So, basically, uses uh, Ethereum tokens, uh, and it has three main native tokens. So, one is uh, what they call land, which is a, a, an ERC seven seven twenty one token, which basically means it's it's a non fungible token. And land represents a parcel of digital land. So because the idea of the metaverse is to mirror the reality, they determine that uh, this land is going to have the equivalent of 16 square meters in, uh, a real, uh, in the real world. And once you have uh, uh, several, uh, you have a group of land, you can have a state. So a state is a group of land together. Uh, and then you have mana, which is uh, another type of token. It's a fungible token. It's basically the currency used in uh, the central land. And so just a fact here, there's a total of 90,601 90, land parcels in the central land. And basically they, they uh, limited the amount of parcels available to sort of limit the supply so that you can uh, ensure you have scarcity uh, and as such you have an upward uh, a pressure on, on the price. So uh, let's consider what main trans transactions can take, can take place uh, in the central land. The main one is the sale or lease of land or state, right? So that's how the central land uh, became famous. The idea that you can sell virtual land to someone and someone can buy the land and use the land to do something. They, they can build something virtual in the land and they can explore that something from an economic point of view. So we have uh, the sale and lease of land, but we also have other economic transactions taking place in the metaverse. So once I buy the land or I, I buy a state, I can build things there. I can, uh, for example, have a social space where I have people gathering together and I charge people to, uh, to, to use my space. I can have concerts in the metaverse. I can have a museum, I can have a casino, I can have games. I can have all sorts of economic activities that we could have in the real world, but we are having that at the metaverse. Now from a, a tax policy perspective, things that happen in the metaverse, we're concerned about economic activity taking place there, economic phenomena. And usually we are concerned about two things. So there's someone providing something to someone, right? So this person who's providing something, let's say a concert, they are, they are providing a concert. These people are earning income as a result. On the other hand, the people who are attending the concert, they are uh, having consumption. So these are two economic phenomena that usually we would tax in reality, right? So if you go to a concert in the physical world, you're gonna pay uh, HST, you're gonna pay sales tax on that. At the same time, those who are making money from it, they, are ha they have income, they are taxed on their income. Uh, the problem is how do we tax 
these events when they take place in the metaverse. So there are two, uh, uh, two main policy alternatives here. We either look at the metaverse as a black box. So we know there are things happening there, but we're not really aware of what's going on there. So we, instead of taxing what's going on there, because it's too difficult to know that, we just uh, wait until the economic phenomena are reflected in the outside world. So for example, you have something in the metaverse, you earn money doing some sort of economic activity in the metaverse. We are not gonna tax you then, we are only taxing you when you convert what you made there as token in the form of fiat money, when you convert that to currency. So when something gets out of the box, you tax that. That, that would be one way of addressing that. The other way would be to uh, actually uh, try to know what's happening there and tax things as they happen in the metaverse. So anytime someone actually earns income in the metaverse, we tax income there. And when there's a consumption take, taking place in the metaverse, we tax consumption there. These two forms of, uh, uh, these two policy alternatives, they, they have challenges. So the first is, if we wait until economic phenomena are reflected in the outside world, if you look, we look at it as a black box, uh, we may have, first, we have the risk of perpetual deferral. So uh, any income you make in the metaverse, uh, you may just keep the money there and keep consuming things there, and that you, the money you made there never leaves the metaverse. So we're not, never gonna be taxing that. And the other problem we have is that although you could tax income that comes out of the metaverse, you could never tax consumption that happens there if you don't know that consumption is taking place there because that's something is going, that's gonna happen there and it's never gonna leave the box. So that's not, that doesn't seem like a very uh, good uh, choice for governments to do. So the other choice would be to really try to know what's happening there and then tax consumption and, and income as they happen in the metaverse. But we also have some problems there because usually in these cases we would need someone to report what's happening there and we usually can't trust users to, to report that. So we tend to need, uh, for tax policy purposes, we need to rely on third party reporting. Uh, so this means that we would need to rely on Decentraland in this example to uh, report to us every transaction that's taking place in the metaverse. Uh, but the problem is uh, Decentraland, as I mentioned earlier, is a DAO. So it's a, not an entity, it's not a legal entity. So it's not really a liable entity uh, upon which we could uh, determine this requirement that they report to us what's happening there uh, because it's just a, a group of users. So how can you make this uh, enforced legislation on multiple users? And it's not clear that Canada or any other jurisdiction would be able to, uh, to, to enforce this legislation. The other problem is uh, even if we so solve this problem, we still have, may have a problem for the central land to know the user's location. Uh, because it's likely gonna be the case that metaverses in the future, they uh, are gonna allow anonymity. So they don't know who the person is. And also people can use VPNs, right? Virtual private networks that uh, disguises their IP address. So we don't know where the person is located. So regarding those questions about where things happened, we are not gonna be able to know where it happened because it happened in the virtual world and we don't know where uh, users are located. Uh, and finally, uh, we still have the problem that the central end may not be even aware that some transactions took place because transactions can be made outside of the platform. So it's not clear that they would have all this information. So if we look f at these two uh, alternatives we have, it doesn't look like a very uh, uh, easy problem to solve from a, a tax policy perspective. Uh, now here, Jinian is gonna continue <laughs> with some more thoughts. <clears throat> so I just press the green, the green button. button. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I have to say that it's really a, a, a true pleasure to be on this panel with my colleagues to talk about something that I really know very little about. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'm very glad to see uh, you know, Professor Muani in the audience and some of the students I taught in tax law. So uh, very good uh, to see you guys. Um, the, so I'm going to, um, you have heard a lot about uh, challenges, interesting questions and problems. So I'm going to give you some certain answers. Yeah? 
<laughs> the best, to the best of my ability. But firstly, um, this is a one certainty. There is an existence of a virtual world, Web 3.0 or Metaverse, or there may be other expressions. So the virtual world is a real thing now, uh, in a way. And then the other sure thing is there is also a legal world. You're in the law school, you're learning the law. There is a legal world regulating everything. And we just don't know exactly how the metaverse will be regulated in every areas, but it will be regulated sooner or later. So that will happen. But then there's a third world, that's the tax world that Ivan and I are covering. In the tax world, it is absolutely a real world because tax is real. And if you don't pay tax, you go to jail. That's also real. So, and tax law has to be legally enforceable. That's another reality. So how to uh, kind of marry the metaverse, the legal world, and the tax world, that's an interesting challenge. So uh, the lay of the land uh, slide, I hope that's the slide, no? Uh, yes. So, I, so this is uh, what's happening uh, now. There is no new law to deal with metaverse transactions. And so the existing laws apply. And tax administrations try to apply existing laws to this new phenomenon. And so for taxpayers, there's uh, some uncertainties because uh, you know that in Canada, paying tax is a voluntary, quote unquote, legal obligation. Taxpayers have to self-report and comply. When the laws are unclear uh, in terms of the metaverse transactions, there may be uncertainties. So some taxpayers, law-abiding taxpayers, may be struggling about how to report transactions they engage in the metaverse. And there's also a real potential of double taxation because in the metaverse, value exchanged may be recognized by laws of multiple jurisdictions. So that same value transfer may be taxed multiple times. And that's a real uh, uh, challenge for taxpayers. For the tax administrations, uh, currently is existing laws interpreted to apply to new transactions. So I give you some examples, CRA, IRS, Singapore, and there's lots of other tax administrations try to make the world work. And the, uh, the difficulty is, of course, like Professor Ozai said, if tax law does not know who does what, when, for how much, then tax law cannot work. So there's lots of unknowns, and uh, the difficulty is to have um, the legal law, the regular laws to help tax law to determine who does what when. And when the legal world is uncertain, still struggling, you have heard <laughs> human rights law, business responsibilities, IP laws, and you're going to hear other legal challenges. So it is very uh, interesting for tax professionals to operate in this particular area. So in terms of tax policy implications, uh, you can easily imagine. There will be some tax revenues lost, and because it's difficult for the tax officials to audit and enforce the laws when they don't have reliable information. And um, there's a huge element of uncertainty, unpredictability. If you want to decide you want to spend your half million dollars investing in cryptocurrency, bitcoins, or some other things, Nike's tokens on the, in the metaverse, then you have to decide, you, you know, tax is part of the calculation. So there's some unpredictability there. And, um, and the metaverse can become a huge tax haven if government cannot figure out who is doing what, but there's a wealth and power in it, so it might be a problem. So what do we do? Uh, are there going to be new rules for metaverse? This is my certain answer, not anytime soon. <laughs> Why? Because um, tax laws operate on the basis of general law. When general laws are not clear, tax law cannot operate on its own. 
So tax law need to know who does what, when, and for how much. And then there is a international, this is a global issue, so no national government will go ahead, legislate tax rules, because it will scare away investors, it will create lots of problems. So no single country can act alone. In the meantime, there is no global tax organization. So you can see the challenge. And if I uh, just, uh, yeah, we're t the time is up. So if I can guide you the trajectory of change with respect to e-commerce. Uh, e-commerce started in the early 1990s. People were saying the sky is going to fall. All the sales taxes revenue will disappear into cyberspace. And guess what? None of that actually happened to a degree that affect the tax system. So nothing happened. <laughs> Until today. So that's the trajectory. So even today, nothing happened. We're still studying. That's the, that's the reality. So thank you. Sorry for the delay. Thank you very much, Professor Lee and Professor Ozai. Um, the next in line is Professor John Penny, uh, who teaches and researches at, at the intersection of law, technology, and human rights uh, with a strong interdisciplinary and empirical uh, basis. And he, Professor Penny is our go-to person when it comes to tech and the law. Uh, you have the floor, Professor Penny. Thank you very much. Great. Just oh, great. There they are. And I know the the simple operation. So. <laughs> Green button. Yeah, green, green forward, red back. Um, so first, uh, that's right, you know, per my title, I'm going to be talking about um, what I call some, some privacy lessons from um, early virtual worlds and virtual world scholarship. And um, I, I like the, how, you know, Ivan and his remarks, he talked about, you know, being a tax lawyer, you know, you're inherently sort of pessimistic. I would say that to be a privacy lawyer today and being a privacy lawyer, you know, in the world, the future world of metaverses, I think it's sort of like the glass is empty, broken, and, you know, I'm going to cut my hand open on it. So, you know, as bad as it gets as a tax lawyer, I can tell you it just, it gets worse as a privacy lawyer. Maybe you'll get a sense of this from some of my remarks. Um, so that's right. I'm going to be talking about some lessons going forward for, for the metaverse, but I'll also be looking backwards at some of the, the issues that scholars and governments and, and courts really wrestled with um, when dealing with virtual worlds um, you know, during the last uh, decade. And you know, one of the real joys for me in engaging with legal issues concerning the metaverse uh, is the f fact that I get to re-engage with some of this scholarship, in particular uh, the work of one, uh, Professor Greg Lestoka, um, who really was a, a, a leading scholar of virtual worlds. And in fact, his, his book, which was published in 2010, which is actually Creative Commons, it's public domain, you can just Google it and find it online, really, I think, anticipates and predicts a lot of the challenges, both on privacy, IP, and a range of issues. Uh, when it comes uh, to the metaverse. And uh, from a personal side, um, uh, Greg was sort of a mentor and, and a friend to me and unfortunately died uh, due to an ag aggressive form of cancer too early. Um, but I think we're really um, lucky to have his insights, which I think provides some great guidance on privacy and a range of these different issues going forward. So I would invite you, if you're interested in these issues, take a look at Greg's work. So. We've been talking about the metaverse, and I know there's no, you know, uh, uh, agreed upon definition. Um, but you know, when you look at what's been written, typically one of the definitions they often will include, you know, reference to virtual reality, augmented reality, avatars, and massive online networks. And you get a sense from some of the other um, presentations. Uh, as well. And so when I, when I thought, when I first started in, in engaging with issues around the metaverse, I immediately started thinking about early virtual worlds, right? An example of being Ultima Online, EverQuest, Sims Online, EVE Online, Britannia, World of Warcraft, Second Life. These were, were real virtual worlds um, that were wildly popular um, in the last decade. Who here has actually ever played or engaged in one of these virtual worlds? Come on, don't be shy. We're, there, there, there we go, more hands up. Great, yeah, I mean, 
Just a few sort of data points on these virtual worlds. As of 2009, there are over 100 million people who are interacting in some ways with these kinds of virtual worlds in the last decade, including, according to another survey, 20% of teens and 10% of adults. Uh, and in fact, by the end of the decade, transactions, in particular on Second Life, we had a real um, virtual economy that had grown. I can't remember exactly the, the sort of the GDP of the Second Life economy, but by 2009, daily virtual property transactions amounted over $1 million USD um, uh, on Second Life alone. So there was, at the same time, naturally, an explosion of scholarship that dealt with a lot of these issues um, concerning IP regulation and what I'm going to be talking about, privacy. And there are some real lessons, I think, from the issues that were tackled, um, what worked, what didn't, uh, to provide a way, sort of a, a road work for dealing with these issues going forward. So here are some of the lessons based on sort of my looking back and looking forward. So the first one being, Leakage isn't a privacy priority. Now you're probably thinking, what the heck does John mean But I say leakage? The idea here was a primary privacy concern for early virtual worlds and the scholars dealing with privacy was concerned that there'd be information about your anonymous virtual world avatar and the things that you're doing in this virtual space. There'd be some link between your virtual identity in your real world identity. And let me just give you an example. So here, one of the sort of leading privacy scholars of, of virtual worlds at the time, Tal Zarsky, who's now, I believe, a dean at University of Haifa in Israel, he sort of opens one of his leading works with this very brief analogy drawing on you know, Joseph K. Um, uh, from uh, fiction. And you know his big concern in this fictional account is that some of his online activities as Castleman has leaked out somehow to online spaces, right? And I think the reason why there was a focus for this, and here's sort of another quote from Zolsky's work. Oh, sorry, I realize I'm, there we go. Um, some real, as stated by Zolsky in one of his other leading works, is that you know, a primary privacy concern was his link. And you understand you know, a little bit from this that there's this playfulness about virtual worlds, this idea that you can go to this virtual space, similar to the kind of spatial thinking that Karis mentioned, um, thinking of virtual worlds as a place to go where you can create a whole new anonymous identity and do playful, creative things. And, and there was a real concern back then that you know, you'd want to keep that an anonymous avatar and linkage between your real world identity is offline linked. And I would say that today, that's really no longer uh, a concern because the algorithms that are going to dominate the metaverse don't care about your differing virtual and real space identities. Right? And just to add to some of the privacy concerns um, that uh, Barnali mentioned earlier uh, in her presentation, just to give you a sense of what's at stake here, a 20 minutes 20 minutes of virtual reality uh, use generates some 2 million unique data elements. Right? And as Bernali mentioned, it's you know, the way you breathe, walk, think, move, et cetera. Um, data collection in the metaverse is involuntary, continuous, rendering consent, which is sort of the cornerstone of our existing privacy uh, regimes, in Canada at least, um, almost impossible. In addition, when you think about the machine learning uh, systems and AI that's being developed today, machine learning algorithms given just five minutes of VR data with all the personally identifiable information stripped away could correctly identify a user with 95% accuracy. So even when the data is anonymous, the data is going to reveal who you are with these powerful AI techniques. And that linkage is just happening all the time. All the definitions, typical definitions of the metaverse is really about the fact that the metaverse will allow for seamless connections between the physical and the virtual realm. That data is going to be combined by these systems with the other data like ubiquitous computing and of course other kinds of companies will develop techniques, machine learning algorithms that combine facial recognition 
with your virtual data, that's going to create a really toxic and complex privacy challenge for all of us. Now, virtual recognition, surveillance, all of these concerns. Now, one of the typical kinds of privacy incidents that are often talked about, how these algorithms can personalize um, your experience, and that's certainly going to be the case on the metaverse. So for example, algorithms on target site was able to figure out how to te that a teen was pregnant before her father did, based on what she was searching for, uh, et cetera. Just think of that capacity really uh, at great magnitudes with this range of additional data. The problem, of course, is that when I look at some of the scholarship that's already growing about privacy in the metaverse, is that the tendency to focus on these linkage concerns is already there. So my recommendation based on the earlier concerns that this ends up in the metaverse, less of a concern, the more concern is to control and regulate all forms of data and not worry about this distinction because it's not really real. Very related to that is the second concern. Player data doesn't exist. So what's player data? This was sort of a, a colloquial and sometimes technical expression used by scholars to refer to data within virtual worlds. That is, when you're engaging in a virtual world and there's a real concern about controlling and, and, and the privacy issues tied to player data. But once again, this is based on this assumed distinction between virtual uh, and offline um, worlds, which really doesn't hold up to the technology and the tracking today. And if you look at some of the concerns from the scholarship, it was, you know, concerned with manipulation, collection, surveillance, price discrimination. These are all valid concerns, but I, what I would suggest to privacy scholars today is don't be concerned just about this within virtual worlds. Be concerned with how the data within virtual worlds will be used to manipulate you online and offline as well. And in fact, this was um, something that, you know, Greg Lestoka himself and other scholars um, actually anticipated. Um, the reality that a lot of this data, you shouldn't make these distinctions, there's no player data or offline data, it's all human related data. And, you know, Greg's sort of anticipation was that the point was is all of this will be used to monetize your experience, leading to potential for great exploitation, manipulation, and the like. Joshua Fairfield's another scholar um, that provided similar insights in this count where we should think about virtual worlds and the metaverse today as simply being part of this broader trend towards a surveillance society. Okay, three. Um, Gamification. So one of the challenges that you see in the early scholarship is the fact that there's this assumption within a lot of these virtual worlds that it's uh, like a game where you have player data and it ought not to be taken seriously and maybe this is a good reason for it not to be regulated or for courts to decline to apply real world laws. Right. And you see that actually in early cases, courts are struggling. Where do you draw the line between a virtual object in World of Warcraft and certain kinds of um, uh, virtual world contexts compared to ones that are more analogous to the real world, like Second Life, which had real virtual world economies and issues like that. I think the lessons that we have since that decade is that gamification isn't a reason not to regulate, that is to decline because it's a game, it's playful, the assumption is this is a different context where a presumption against the application of the law shouldn't apply. I think instead, um, let me make sure I'm on the right side, there we go. Uh, I think the real assumption here is that um, gamification, which has been used and abused by companies, by social media platforms, in order to add a kind of playfulness to data collection, to surveillance. Um, this is a reason for us to take this seriously and to regulate. And this is something that I think Greg anticipated in his work and anticipated the work of Julie Cohen 
um, whose brilliant work on the legal constructions of information capitalism expressly talks about this phenomena, that gamification is used by these companies to render surveillance and data collection sort of playful. Be a part of this virtual world, spend time with your friends, relax, it's not to be taken seriously, but the data that's being collected and how it's going to be used really requires a serious response. And fourthly, um, one of the other tendencies um, towards the earlier scholarship is looking at virtual property law as being a foundation for privacy. And that, again, is something that's shown to have been a real dead end. Um, today, the regimes that are going to be regulating virtual worlds, like the metaverse, is going to be contract law, and it's going to be statute. The problem with Canada today is contract law, as we all know, no one reads terms of service. So there are great holes in that as a practical legal regime to deal with privacy and data protection issues, and our current data protection regime, the PEPITA, has so many holes that need significant reforms, but the problem is that the current laws that are being proposed by the government, the Consumer Privacy Protection Act, has even greater holes. So we're going to need consumer protection statutes to be reformed and updated. We're going to need more robust data protection. And maybe one final lesson. Um, just to finish with, there's also really an assumption in the early scholarship that, you know, as these virtual worlds, as more people migrate to the metaverses and spend more time there, inevitably lawmakers will respond and there'll be new laws. That was proven not to be the case. Why? Because these powerful actors can lobby and they can undercut both judicial and legislative policy making on this count. So if we want to be serious about privacy, we need to advocate for better privacy protections. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Penny. And uh, now we have uh, Professor Dan Priel. Uh, Professor Priel teaches and researches uh, on everything, basically, uh, but uh, specifically on legal theory, uh, private law, welfare state and the law, and the history of ideas. Professor Priel, thank you very much. We have the floor. Okay, so uh, <laughs> thank you, Valeria, for organizing this, this uh, wonderful event. Already I've learned so much, uh, and, uh, and one thing to, to counter what Valeria said that is, is that I've actually never uh, thought much or, or, or written about the metaverse, so, so this was a, a real uh, opportunity for me to think about, uh, about the metaverse, as a, and as a beginner, I sort of started uh, with, with this, uh, which you may know, it's, it's from the ancient days of the internet, 1996, a Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. Um, and it reflects this idea of the internet as, a, as, as this new place with no government, with no boundaries, and that will be a utopian place, exactly for this reason. Um, and somehow, something went wrong in the way to utopia, so here just, the titles of three books from, from uh, the last decade or so. Uh, and you can see the, the, the net delusion, hate crimes in cyberspace, the shame machine, all uh, reflecting a, a somewhat uh, a different change in, the, in, in, in how we think about the internet. And, and if you want another example of this, which I thought sort of reflects perhaps best the change in attitudes, uh, these are two books by the same author. Uh, one is sort of peak internet uh, utopia, uh, The Wealth of Networks, um, 2006. Twelve years later, the, the, the key idea is still network, it's still the same word, but look, just don't even need to understand English, just look at the, the different in the images to see how, how our sense of the internet has, has changed. Um, and the subtitles of the two books are also revealing of, of this change uh, in attitude. And and so I think one thing that uh, is uh, helpful for us to remember when we're discussing uh, the internet and the metaverse is that 
technology can change, but there's one thing that doesn't change, which is human nature. And so in some respects, I think it's safe to say that um, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Everything, as, as, long, as, as much as things change, things will stay the same. And so at least as far as Tordlo is concerned, um, many things that, that we are familiar with from uh, the offline world, identity theft, fraud, passing off, uh, which is sort of the common law version of trademark uh, violations, defamation, uh, all of these you'll have them. So identity theft, you'll have stolen avatars. And fraud, you will have this on, on the metaverse. In fact, you have this already. And you may have this with stolen avatars. Passing off, um, so I also have the, uh, there we go. I also have the Meta Birkin uh, <laughs> banks uh, as an example of, of, of um, sort of a violation of intellectual property or, 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 uh, and defamation. Think of someone, so there have been people who have made a lot of money off uh, Second Life, for example, by buying and selling property there. Imagine that someone starts uh, telling about these individuals that they are unreliable business people. Uh, well, that could hurt their business. So you can have a defama defamation claim. What about professional practice who said, well, that's not something that we could have uh, online or in the metaverse. But in fact, there were, I looked it up, there were people who were offering psychological therapy on, on Second Life. And so once you have that, the possibility of uh, professional practice is uh, available there. In fact, given that it's not entirely clear what licensing happens there with respect to those who offer psychological uh, therapy on, in, in the metaverse, it may well be that the only way that we could get to them will be through tort law and not through sort of violation of some professional standards. And you might say, well, maybe here's one thing that's, that's new. So in December 2022, uh, Court, uh, trial court in Quebec uh, approved a class action against Fortnite for making, among other things, for making their, their games too addictive. Just a few days ago, the Court of Appeal of Quebec affirmed this decision. So this is now, uh, looks like it's going to trial. And said, well, here's something new, making video games addictive. Um, but that too is not really new. <laughs> so um, in Quebec, we have the, actually the largest tort damages in Canadian history is a, a court decision with respect to tobacco companies for making their product too addictive. Um, by the way, if you wonder why this lawsuit went to Quebec and not to any other province, I'm almost certain that that's, that's exactly the reason because this lawsuit was successful in Quebec. Uh, attempts to sue um, casinos for making their venue too addictive, and for suing the government for not regulating sufficiently, attempts of that kind were, were made in Nova Scotia and were not successful. So that's why I suspect the plaintiffs there went to uh, Quebec. But again, the idea that uh, a product or a service that, that is being sold may be too addictive, that too is not new. And so, um, I think in general we can say that as long as the, the in-world, that is the metaverse action, has monetary implications, a real-world real tort should, should not be too difficult. And here actually tort law has an advantage, I think, over uh, all these other areas of law that we, that we talked about exactly because it's, it's, it's not statutory for the most part. The foundation are vague enough and not based in, in the statutory text that you have to kind of fit your, your lawsuit into. And that sort of in some respects is the weakness of tort law, but that's also its strength when you have a new area which is poorly regulated where courts can actually step in and say, actually, you know, this is not that difficult from something that we've seen before. And we can analogize or extend tort law to this new domain. Um, and so in this respect, even the fact that we were talking about psychological harm that may happen in the metaverse, again, as long as it has real world implications, and Barnelli has spoken about this, um, then we, I, I think tort law can and will be able to adapt. 
The difficulty will arise if, uh, if there is an attempt maybe to use tort law for kind of pure tort, torts in the metaverse. So trespass in the metaverse, uh, when it doesn't translate to um, real world monetary loss, that may be something that tort law will struggle with. Perhaps if you have avatar defamation that does not translate to real world monetary laws, that will be something that will be difficult to uh, deal with. But perhaps because we live in such a commodified world and commercialized world that in fact, many times, in many, many cases, what will happen in the metaverse will not stay in the metaverse. And that, of course, ties to, to what John has, uh, has just said. Um, and so in this respect, it's worth remembering that scamming people with tech is not a new thing. That's the Mechanical Turk, which is a sort of a, a supposedly a chess playing automaton from the 18th century, which was not really, it was really there was someone hiding inside and playing chess. But the idea of using tech to, to scam people is not new. And so in this respect, um, tort law may be actually be able to come to, to the rescue. I do want to say uh, here that um, there is sort of when you think about this, in the absence of um, regulation of, of statutory and, and much of what we heard is in the previous talks is that we don't have regulation in all these areas. Um, so, so think about it in this way. We have on the one hand privatized regulation, right? So when you say, oh, we have free speech. Uh, in Canada, in fact, what we have is outsourced speech regulation to YouTube, to um, you know, Facebook, to Twitter. There, we're, we've outsourced to them the regulation of speech, and we have tort law in the background. Interestingly, and I think not insignificantly, one further layer in which you can use tort law is to sue the software company for failing to regulate, right? So if, if you want to say, if, you want, if, if you've been harmed by someone in the metaverse and you think that you're, um, you're, you, you would want to get compensation and say, my chances of getting compensation from the person who did this are, sig are insignificant, you may well try. I'm not going to say it's going to be simple, but it's definitely something that I can see will happen. Uh, that people will actually sue Second Life or Facebook or Meta now uh, for the sake of, by saying you have failed to regulate properly. And so here again, uh, tort law actually may be at least for a while uh, the go-to option. Now for all this you may say, okay, so you gave us a, a, a rather uh, boring and maybe disappointing answer in the sense that you just said everything will stay the same, nothing will change. Um, and so uh, I do want to suggest maybe, and here maybe because it's early days, I want to speculate on something uh, somewhat related to what Bernali has spoken about, about the possibility that maybe the metaverse may make something a little bit better. And so I re return to this uh, statement from the early days of the internet. Uh, and typically this statement is talked as, uh, is mentioned in the context of this boundaryless world, this governmentless world. But um, as Karis has said, it, there's something else that people now talk about in the context of the metaverse. It's also a bodiless wor world. And this is actually si typically seen as one of its great strengths, right? So um, Barlow here says, but you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. So contrary to the, our, our bodies that go old and decay, uh, but um, the, the, the world of the mind is timeless, is boundless, and is eternal. And if you say um, that, well, this is old stuff, no one will say this anymore. Well, here's a book just published last year about the metaverse, the same, exact same thing. We've always wanted to see, feel, and understand more than we do. And in pursuit of these goals, we have consistently tried to transcend the limits imposed on us by biology and geology. And another quote from the same book, making exactly the same point, right? So, so with the metaverse, there's still this new optimism that finally we will have this internet that will give us what was promised to us in 1996 and we never got. 
But maybe that's actually the problem. Because one thing that scientists have come to see is that human cognition is embodied. Now, what is embodied cognition? That could be a topic for a two-hour conversation, a whole course. So, but if you want kind of the briefest version of it, I call it anti-Cartesianism squared. What do I mean by this? So if Cartesianism, Descartes was the idea of the, the body and mind are completely separate, dualism. So the first stage was to say the mind is the brain. So that's the first embodiment of, of our mind. But the second stage is to say actually our mind is in some respects in our body. And, for, and, and there are many ways of seeing this. There are people who looked at, at the way our metaphors work, for example, and they notice that so many of them have a spatial element to them. Um, you know, we progress towards goals, and, and we go up when things go, are, are fine, and we go down when things are bad, and so on. Here, I want to talk about the idea of social cognition. And social cognition is many things. Not all of them are... Um, related to our bodies. So there's a big list of aspects of social cognition. Not everything is embodied. Uh, and if you look at the list of things that are social cognition, not, it's, uh, it's good that, that if we disembody ourselves, maybe some good things will come off of it. Um, so um, prejudices and stereotypes that may come from the fact that is, is an aspect of our social cognition. And maybe a disembodiment will reduce the extent of, of that. Um, okay, but um, we also have some aspect of social cognition that's embodied. And there is really interesting research about this. The way that when we see someone's face, we, we many times people re respond with adopting the same facial features. And that in itself may also cause a mental state. So you can see here the, the way our social embodied cognition works. So we see something um, and we imitate the facial expression and that gives us this social uh, state. And that ties to the question of online harassment. And why is it so prevalent and why is it so terrible? That relates to what Bernali was talking about. Uh, a recent case from the Ontario Superior Court dealt with online harassment and this is, an, and, and this is just one example of, of, of a phenomenon that's, that's extremely widespread and prevalent. And when we ask why it happens there, well, there are several reasons, anonymity, the fact that often it's de-individuated, it's groups that kind of pile on together, but also the fact that we don't have these bodily cues that we get in the real world, the disembodiment of the internet. And so how do we re-embody our online communications? Well, so one thing that we do is we use emojis, for example. And emojis get a bad rap, but actually, yeah, okay, it's 15 seconds of video. <laughs> Oh, it's not working. Oh, it is. No. Okay, let's we'll skip that. So basically, in this video, which I think here, and I tried to make it only the last 15 seconds, they say, oh, you know, in the future, we'll have emojis as New York Times ah. headlines. And she kissed you back. And really? There we go. Just less than Thanks. a month ago, uh, <laughs> we have an emoji as, as a New York Times headline. Shit where you eat. No, 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 That's no, right. no. <laughs> Yeah, that we was, love this yeah. We're never going to be able to come um, back. Inevitably. And of course, now we have advanced emojis, which are ways of embodying our conversation online. And maybe the metaverse could help with that. And ironically, it could do this exactly if all those predictions about this bodiless world are actually proved to be wrong exactly if the world that we envision will be more like the real world. Fortunately for this, the metaverse will have to look better than this. <laughs> and I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Professor Peel.
Um, so the last uh, presentation is uh, from myself. Um, I'm Valerio De Stefano. I am the Canada Research Chair in Innovation Law and Society here at Osgood, where I teach and research on at the intersection of labor, uh, law, and technology. And uh, the way I came to um, get interest in the metaverse was precisely because, and, and Web 3.0, was beca precisely because I was attracted by the idea that the metaverse and Web 3.0 allow for a more immersive, uh, immediate uh, online experience. And uh, I was actually, um, compelled by uh, knowing that uh, there are uh, online companies and tech companies and even giant tech companies that are uh, working to build uh, offices that uh, are online but basically get more integrated, uh, offer a better integrated online experience to allow people to interact online as if they were in the office. So basically the concept of a special web where you go to work, uh, you are online, you work remotely, but it's much more similar to when you are actually on a real workplace. And um, what really attracted me uh, was the idea that the companies that build this embedded already uh, productivity tracking tools in these on life spaces. By productivity tracking tools, I mean a series of technologies that monitor workers uh, basically uh, relentlessly to know what they're doing and to check on the results and their outputs of the work. Uh, this is already problematic because even though I'm a big fan of remote work, already in remote work we are seeing a panoply of technologies that uh, is constantly monitoring what workers do online. Uh, so people are monitored um, in the sense of how many keystrokes they give in a certain minute of time, or uh, videos are recorded of their laptop, uh, screenshots are taken, but also technologies aim at detect emotional and, men and mental states of people by recording the tone of their voice, by looking at their um, facial expressions with uh, the cameras, uh, tracking their heartbeat, uh, basically to show the employers whatever workers are doing or arguably even thinking or feeling in a certain given moment. So this connects very well with what uh, Professor Chudry was saying uh, in her presentation. Uh, the risk is that the technology that we will use in the metaverse or whatever we want to call it, uh, 3D spaces, but also uh, virtual reality, as Professor Chudry was saying, will collect an uh, enormous amount of data that will reveal to our employers and managers whatever we are doing, whatever we are feeling, without any uh, filter. This is something that companies are already aiming at, this is already a reality in our workplaces. This technology will only enhance these issues. And the problem here is that the workplace is already a place where people are subject to external powers and authority. The employer has the authority to direct, monitor, and discipline the workforce. The contract of employment is a unique contract in our legal systems because it gives a party, a private party, all this authority. And then labor law tries to sort of uh, limit to certain extent this authority, but the basic idea of employment is that somebody has power over other people. And when technology enhances the power, this is where the labor lawyers have uh, issues uh, to bring up. Um, the risk here is that we combine these extremely invasive technologies uh, that are present in remote work with the more traditional and oft invasive power dynamics that exist in physical workplaces. So in a way, it's a way of combining two sets of power and two ways of uh, technology enhancing those powers. Uh, 
A more interactive experience, as Professor Priel just uh, said, also enhances the, ability, the, the possibility for cyberbullying. And again, yes, there are already studies that show that people are more prone to uh, bully people online, and this also affects workers. Now, the, the, the bad news is that our laws, our legislation, are not always up to speed when it comes to cyberbullying. We have standards against boost bullying and harassment at the workplace, but those standards don't often reflect the reality of cyberbullying. Um, together with some colleagues in 2019, I have conducted a, a study for the International Labour Office that shows how many legislation around the world uh, on, on bullying doesn't affect form of online bullying properly. Uh, on top of that, Technology has already facilitated uh, what, um, together with uh, my colleague uh, Nicola Conturis at uh, UCL, uh, we call contractual distancing. Contractual distancing is a form of outsourcing uh, works or tasks to in independent contractors, uh, but actually detaining powers to dictate standards and monitor the workforce. Uh, a very common form of contractual distancy is, uh, is, of course, platform work. Think of the Amazon Mechanical Turk or Upwork, but also Uber, DoorDash. Here, the technology is used to exert power on people, to control their acts, discipline them, but at the same time, the technology is also used as a smoke screen to say, well, these people are independent contractors, is the algorithm that uh, controls them, uh, we are not the real bosses, there is no real employment relationship. And when there is no real employment relationship in most jurisdictions around the world, there also are not legal or uh, any legal regulation or labor and employment rights. Um, the platform economy has already been a big mass pilot test for these forms of contractual distancing. And if we create a uh, on life work experience in which we'll be able to transfer people to uh, do more remote work because it's going to be more realistic and control is going to be more present. Uh, we will probably have uh, workers that work for retail shops online or for offices online. So we will have retail workers, white collar workers transferred to the metaverse and Again, the fear is that the technology will then be used to retain control and power while at the same time claim that there is no employment relationship there. And even if there was an employment relationship, and even if you wanted to claim that you are misclassified and you should be treated as an employee, what are the laws that apply to you? Is it the laws where you are working? Is it the laws where the platform is based? Is it where the employer is based? Uh, what are we talking about here? And again, this is not a new problem. With platform work, when it's executed online, we have exactly the same issue. Uh, who, what are the laws that apply to online work, to the Amazon Mechanical Turk? Is it the law of where the person is based? Is it the, work, uh, the law where the customer is, where the, where the platform is? There is no clear standard on that in most of the cases. So, all these problems will be uh, enhanced and augmented as uh, the more the technology progresses if we don't do anything about it. And again, um, uh, some, uh, someone has mentioned the Wild West before, and platform work was precisely a way, especially online platform work, was a, precisely a way to exploit the fact that the internet, when it comes to labor and employment protection, is a sort of Wild West. So, the first thing that we have to think about is to think of an international convention on conflicts of laws that will regulate what kind of laws apply and what regulation, what labor and employment regulation will um, apply to uh, work that is conducted online. This is uh, largely overdue. On top of it, we need better standards protecting people from invasive and uh, excessive forms of monitoring and surveillance. There is no justification for any technology that allows your employer to know 
what you are thinking, what you are feeling through your eye movement or to your, uh, through your heartbeat. This is something that we have banned in the past. Think uh, about the idea that nobody can be subject to the truth machine at work unless they work for the CIA. There is no reason to allow this to happen through virtual reality or through other systems that are already in place in our workplaces. Uh, better and updating our regulation on violence and harassment at the workplace to bring fully cyberbullying in is another step that we definitely have to take. And finally, we should move towards a more universalistic approach to labor and employment protection. The contract of employment based on subordination uh, is probably not the most adaptable legal tool to take care of the fact that people work today um, in ways that are different from when the contract of employment originated. We should probably dispense with the idea that we only attach rights to subordination and to control, and we should go towards a more universalistic approach that protects people that work just because they are persons that work for other entities. And with that, I stop. Thank you very much again. So we have uh, some time now for uh, Q&A, uh, both um, here in person and, uh, and online. Um, if you want to uh, have a question here in person, please walk to the mics that are uh, at the side of the room. Uh, you're very welcome to do so. Hi. Um, I just want to find out whether uh, you have encountered issues related to criminal liabilities arising from the uh, metaverse and how they have been dealt with. Thank you. Can you go back? Can you help me describe the kind of crime? Uh, yeah, so... Um, can there be a crime arising from the metaverse? Can somebody commit a crime? Can you be more specific? Like what kind? Like uh, you're making a lot of money from doing something in metaverse, you fail to report it on your tax return? So um, <laughs> just, <laughs> I, I really don't know much about the metaverse, yes. uh, just to start with. I'm uh, just trying to, uh, raise an example. Uh, let's see, somebody has reported that um, a kind of crime has been committed against mm. him or her in the metaverse. Mm. Okay, how can that be dealt with? Mm. That's, that's, that's my question. Yeah. Is it possible to even commit a crime in the, in the metaverse? That's a good question. I thought you were referring to committing a crime by not paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> in that case, I can help you. <laughs> if it is a general kind of crime uh, similar to real world criminal law, uh, who is bold enough? You, John, to I, answer. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not going to hold myself out as a criminal law expert. Um, what, I, what I can say is that, you know, thinking about some of the, the history of um, you know, what was happening in virtual world. So, you know, the metaverse is new, so it's hard to sort of like make a point to any cases with respect to the metaverses, but certainly there were examples of virtual object theft um, that were civilly prosecuted in the United States with people suing both Linden Labs, who is the developer of Second Life. Um, there are instances where Linden Labs basically deleted or suspended and permanently an account of a user, and that user had amassed a wealth of virtual property within Second Life, and therefore later sued, lost because of the terms of service, um, governed the relationship. Um, but there were other cases where certainly one user had misappropriated a virtual object or virtual property within the virtual world, and they sued civilly in US district courts. Um, so yes, I think you can, um, absolutely commit crimes in virtual worlds. Um, the challenge, of course, is some of what my, my distinguished panelists have talked about as 
Um, just a moment ago, Valerio had uh, mentioned questions of jurisdiction. If the court is willing to take jurisdiction over your claim, that's one key part of the battle. And the other is just thinking about you know, the other constituent elements. So um, yes, you can commit crimes in virtual worlds. Is it simple um, for courts to work out? No, um, it's gonna be complex, but I think, um, yeah, I would leave it there. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Hi, so we know that technologies do embed ideologies. Like in your experience, like broadly speaking, does law tend to mirror that ideology or counter what the ideology is embedded in the technology itself? I, I, can, I can say something to that. I, I think uh, the question, the technology is developed on the basis of certain ideological assumptions that sometimes are just unconscious and programmers don't even know that they have certain ideological assumption. Uh, I can speak of my field. The assumption in my field is that the employer have unfettered, unfettered power to know whatever you're doing uh, at, at the workplace because you are working and you are being paid. And so there is no recognition of the fact that you are a human being with agency and that we should protect that autonomy and agency. Uh, the engineers that program these things don't think about that. They just think we have to sell a technology or to an employer They will be interested to know everything. So uh, in my opinion, the ideology is already embedded in the technology in, in, in this field, but I don't know if the other panelists might have pro Professor Ali, please. Maybe just add one example that in tax filing, most people use software programs to file tax returns. There's a lot of, there's some research indicating that the software developer is slightly pro-government mm -hmm. in developing the software so that their software is certified by the CRN and IRS to be used. So if there's a choice in interpreting tax law, whether it's for the taxpayer's benefit or for the government, the developer will try to interpret the law in a way and write a software to guide you to take the option that is in favor of the government. But the degree of deference is not that big because they also want to sell the software to the tax filers. So there, but there is evidence showing there is a slight uh, preference. And there is no law that I'm aware of that is trying to correct that. So before going to the other question in person, there's a, a question online. Um, yes, please. The second segment? Uh, there are two questions online. Um, the first one is, is there a specific court which is responsible to handle the cases that are coming from the metaverse world? And I think that's an easy answer, which is no. <laughs> right? Uh, I think I can speak for everybody, so that, that one's a no. And the second question is, as a remote worker, the person wrote, I was impressed to learn about labor law and metaverse. How far along do you think we are in developing this area of law to protect contractors, for example? Um, we are not anywhere <laughs> near <laughs> doing that, so this is also another answer. Uh, the problem is that when we think of labor law, we normally think only to employees unless certain things uh, occur. And uh, there's this tendency to uh, basically consider people that do freelancing online as sort of, again, as, as the Wild West where no law applies. So. Um, that is a big challenge. There are some proposals ar around the world to better regulate online platform work, but they are still normally conceived as if they were applying to the uh, real world, I, I use this very bad expression, to the to physical world. Uh, so we are actually very far behind uh, on that. Do you mind if I just uh, of course. Just coming back to the, the first question, actually, I mean, so uh, Facebook currently has the Facebook Oversight Board, which is typically analogized sometimes to sort of a Facebook Supreme Court. So you can imagine maybe that Facebook might 
um, constitute a similar body to deal with disputes arising within the metaverse. Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't exist right now. I just wanted to add one additional sort of um, response to the last question um, about you know values and ideology and I think design and I think one of the other insights from you know early scholarship and early experience with the internet and platforms is and it's a great question because it goes to questions of design and ideology and I would say that the ideology of course in the metaverse is going to be capitalism. But what AI systems and machine learning systems bring is a new dimension, an interesting dynamic where if you have an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm that is designed to maximize profit, it may end up manipulating and uh, exploiting consumers who are engaging with the platform and in that algorithm, even if it wasn't designed for doing so. And that's, there's research that showed that fact when it comes to machine learning dynamics. So even what the designers might intend may not be the reality for the systems you'll interact with in the metaverse. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? okay. Great. Uh, thanks for doing this. Really enjoyed the panel. Thought it was interesting and uh, really insightful. So my question's in relation to the Nike and StockX claim and then counterclaim that Professor Craig brought up. Um, have any of you seen either mention of hypothetical uses or actual uses by businesses um, using soulbound tokens opposed to traditional NFTs to sell and maybe control their IP? So opposed to having everybody be able to sell virtual sneakers, maybe only Nike would be able to facilitate that secondary market, so to speak. I guess you could analogize that to what Ticketmaster does with select like non-transferable tickets for events. Obviously that's in the meat verse or the real world, depending on your philosophy. But anyways, yeah, so just rambling at this point, but just generally any soul bound opposed to NFT uses for products, buying and selling in the metaverses. I, it sounds like you probably know more about that particular thing than I do, so <laughs> thank you for <laughs> alerting me to it. Um, it does seem like probably the game plan is to ensure the control over the secondary market is achieved in the metaverse and the virtual world in a way that it has never been able to be achieved in the real world. And so I firmly expect that new tools will be used to try to make that so, and that the StockX litigation is part of that to make sure that that secondary market can't really take off through NFTs and other digital objects. But uh, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what you think about whether that is gonna change the landscape. Um, it, it strikes me that it's just, to the broader themes I was bringing up, it's, it's kind of demoralizing to think that this is just going to be a way maybe to, you know, if we think about the metaverse as a way to fix the mistakes um, that we made in the online world, um, then, the question is whose mistakes are being fixed, right? And right now it looks like it's the gaps that we left by design in the online world that are supposed to allow for competition and expression and freedom. Those are the gaps that are being closed. So what we're perfecting is actually capitalism in the metaverse as opposed to its opposite freedom. I'll just add that um, I like the meat verse versus metaverse, yeah. which I've never heard before. That was neat. But, but I, I want to say that, uh, in fact, you see in, in the real world a very similar phenomenon. So, so you probably know that if you buy software today, you don't buy it, you license it. You, you, you never buy a, a, an online product anymore. You only buy it for a limited amount of time. And one aspect of this is, again, I, I read that happens in the real world, that, that um, software companies, uh, you know, car companies for that matter, if they don't like the way you use your, the, the, the product, they can disable it remotely. And so something like this presumably could be done with, um, with your, um, you know, Meta Nike or, or uh, that you purchased, that, that they could, through software, limit who, um, who you can sell it to, or, or that you cannot sell it anymore. So, so that that's that. In fact, I do know that in Second Life there were some properties that were could not be resold, and so um, that that option is definitely. Um, and that's 2009 or 2008, not not like 15 years ago. So, so that I I don't see this as a as a as a speculation, but rather as reality. Okay. Thank you both. Hi, so I have one question regarding employment law, like for the metaverse and having like virtual 
like uh, offices on all of this. So how we can see it in the future, like that we have like a virtu virtual offices and pl place of work and how it will be regulated by the labor law. And second, like, and secondly, like, um, talking from the employer point of view regarding the supervision uh, softwares related to, you know, having like um, supervising and uh, monitoring all the employees, like, you know, at their workplaces and especially with this new technology. And second question regarding IP, uh, you know, there is like a platform, it's not so well developed, it's called Roblox, so the kids, like, you know, with simple, you know, um, uh, simple uh, skills, they can have like a games and they can promote it on this Roblox and like people they can go and play and all of this like intellectual property, it is like it's not clear like the owner of this like property of the intellectual property of this game because the kids they are developed by kids with the use of the uh, you know the software equipment that they are uh, you know available for them. So how it will be tackled by the Intel, 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 Intel uh, IP laws? Um, well, I, I will give a very um, quick answer to the to the first uh, question. The, the the issue with um, with employers is that in many cases they don't even know what they're doing because they lease or buy the technology for someone else and most employers are not tech savvy enough to know what they're doing. They only receive the data, they only receive these reports that are uh, produced in ways that they don't understand and they are sitting uh, on a mountain of possible liabilities that they are not foreseeing. So better regulating that uh, is not just a uh, labor-friendly thing is also something that would help uh, businesses and employers to avoid liabilities that may occur. So uh, the issue is, is there a political will to act on this? And unfortunately for the moment, in my opinion, there is not. Um, and yes, I just say, sorry, that the, um, you know, one of the things that I, I like to conceive of when we're talking about technology is the way that it can democratize creativity. It can give people skills and capacities that they don't necessarily have in the real world. And certainly at watching my like eight-year-old build buildings in Roblox was impressive. I was like, there's an architect in the making. Like it, the amazing things that they come up with in their minds and now they find their way onto the screen. That is creativity that meets all the thresholds of original authorship. Um, under copyright law. Um, but the reality, of course, is that um, these are technological tools, that we find them in platforms, that their use is governed by terms of service, and those terms of service are imposed through boilerplate contract terms that people don't read. And so the ownership of any particular IP created in any particular universe within the metaverse is going to be subject to those terms of service and control. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I think we uh, are well beyond time. We may have uh, time for a, um, another question or a couple more questions, please. Yeah, so thank you so much, professors. So my question is that, um, again, Metaverse is built by Meta, so you have servers in a particular jurisdiction right now, let's assume the US, and until the time you don't have an international convention, maybe a change in private national law or something like that, is it possible that if there is a higher regulation, then there would be countries who would be allowing companies to set up servers such as Facebook in maybe China or India? And does that relate to a race to the bottom where countries in Global South would not want to regulate um, issues regarding metaverse? And in that situation, if we do not have an international convention on conflict of laws or something like that, is it possible that um, is, is it possible that it might just not be possible to regulate tax liability or tort liability issues or contractual issues? Um, and is that a situation where we need to think about it from a global south perspective? Or like, is it possible to have a race to the bottom in technology issues if there is an over-regulation from, from the global north countries, essentially? The only thing I was thinking of as you were speaking was mentioning um, the, the question of the of U.S. law and the hegemony of, of U.S. law and governing online spaces. And you know we've certainly seen that in, um, in the internet when it comes to um, 
control over copyright protected works. For example, the whole notice and take down scheme that we see online when we try to encounter or access a file and it's been taken down and it's no longer accessible, that's all governed by US law, which was through trade negotiations and political pressure, of course, internationalized. But you have domestic systems like in Canada where we create exceptions for user generated content that essentially are meaningless because the actual architecture of the internet allows for the automated takedown of content, no matter whether you've got an exception or a right even to do something in your own jurisdiction. So I think there really is a big concern that this becomes just another uh, US jurisdiction where there's some um, choice of law for more favorable contract terms by those in power who get to set the terms, but otherwise is not subject to a broad sort of transnational um, regulatory scheme. And I think that's what Bernali is talking about when she signals the potential and maybe even the need to move ahead and think about this at an international level before we get locked into a particular jurisdiction's laws. Maybe just a quick uh, addition. That's a great question. Um, the, in, in terms of regulating this new metaverse, uh, the OECD, the Organization for uh, Rich Countries, has already issued some standard reporting standards for cryptocurrency. Um, race to the bottom is a concern. Uh, the role of the Global South in developing standards uh, is a concern. Unfortunately, there are no good answers because the Global South does not possess the power, either technology or capital or expertise. So now, hopefully, they are involved in the process. How much they can drive and dictate um, is, is an interesting question, but there's no satisfying answer to that yet. It's up to you guys. If you're interested in the true inclusiveness and equity, play a role. Because the current uh, establishment is not leaning in that way. Yeah. Okay, we're running out of time. I'm just gonna throw out some of the questions online and you guys can answer as you see fit. So the first question was about any response to how um, Bill C-11 and Bill C-18, how they can affect the metaverse. I thought that might be for you, Karis. Um, in general, how should criminal law be enforced in the metaverse? Um, I think this question relates to that as well. Sexual harassment, how can that be enforced? Uh, the, there was a response to our, the or original question about whether or not there is a court. So the answer was no, but should there be a court? Um, and then um, there was a question here about throwing out the fax machine and replacing it with more modern, secure uh, digital alternatives. Um, which sounds like a great initiative, but do you think the personal information will be at more risk in the metaverse? And then finally, this one might be for you, Karis. Uh, somebody from the Southern District of New York considered Dapper Labs NBA top shop moments, securities, and thus subject to federal securities laws. Is this the correct way to control and supervise the NFT market in which the exploitation of individual image rights of sports workers in particular is without control? All right, so half our <laughs> panelists need to go and teach classes, um, so I'll just leave it open to whoever can I will, anything. I can just say, I, yeah. the last one is too complicated, but the, um, I will just jump in and say we're seeing a lot of attempts to now to regulate the online world, and we're seeing it Bill C-18, uh, which is the online news, and C-11, which is about broadcasting. These are efforts increasingly by Canada to create regulations and laws that are going to control what can be seen, what can be accessed how results can be ranked, um, who gets the money when people click through to read news stories. These are, um, for the most part, I would say, not well thought out interventions at this point, likely to produce enormous unintended consequences, and therefore a good warning for where we need to start thinking more carefully about how um, real world um, regulation interacts with online experience and freedom of expression and we have clearly a lot of thinking still to do on that um, in just in the inter on the internet never mind uh, in the metaverse uh, I, I just want to say something about replacing the truth uh, machine with other more sophisticated technologies. The point is, you should not know the truth. You should not have access to the feelings, mental emotions, internal occurrence of people, ever. It's not that if you are an employer, you could do it just because you're paying. Uh, this is the, the issue. It's not 
everything that is technologically possible should be allowed. So it is not about having a better technology, it's about banning too invasive and abusive technologies. We have done this in the past, we should not stop doing that. And with that merry note, uh, <laughs> I think that... I think we have one. Uh, we have our last... Are you sure? Yeah? I could probably ask. Okay, I'm really sorry. Uh, okay, uh, then uh, again, sorry for the last question that uh, we will try to address uh, in person. Uh, thank you very much to you all, uh, both in presence and online, for being with us today. Thank you to our uh, panelists. Uh, thanks a lot, and see you soon. Thank you.